Thank you very much. Uh, as she said, my name is John Mulligan. Uh, I work with my colleague here, uh, Raghavendra Talor. We work in storage at Red Hat. I've been working on this project for about uh, two years. Um, and uh, so one of the main issues that I've been dealing with that during that time is stabilizing and making the software that we work on more um, robust. That's why I have my alternate title here, Teaching a Stateful Application How to Better Survive in Rough Turf. I don't think this mic is picking me up at all. Is it? Okay. So we have an alternate title, which is a little bit more accurate, but has fewer buzzwords. Here is my graphical representation of our system when things go wrong. Uh, you've got our poor application not really surviving well in the hostile environment. And hopefully, after this, you'll have learned a little bit from our experiences. All right, bear with me. It's a small crowd, so I hope you don't mind. Okay. So I've been working on storage for about 10 years, um, working on this project for about two. Um, this, uh, this talk is mainly about dealing with a stateful application running, in OC, uh, running <coughs> excuse me, under Kubernetes or OpenShift. I know I'm not getting picked up. I'm going to switch. Hello? Okay. That's a little better. Sorry about that. Okay. Uh, so specifically, the project that we've been working on is called Hiketi. It's a bridge between um, the storage back end and the front ends. Uh, as I said, it's a stateful application, and the um, <clears throat> and hopefully you'll be learning a little bit about how we made the software a bit more robust. Uh, quick introduction to Hiketi itself. Um, Hiketi is written in Go. Uh, it has a front end with a REST style API. The API is accessed by Go clients or Python clients. On the back end, Hiketi is actually reaching out and configuring storage services. These are either running natively inside of Kubernetes itself or on dedicated storage nodes, and Hiketi has to control them via commands running over SSH. The, um, the system was originally designed for use managing um, the cluster system under OpenStack. That was its very early origins, and it quickly became adapted to being used um, for OpenShift. <clears throat> the system um, was originally designed for use on a, a system, single uh, node, and it didn't really have any sort of built-in HA capabilities. If the server went down, it stayed down. So we've dealt with a lot of different um, engagements, both on the community and many on the commercial side. A lot of what we did is based directly on those experiences. So again, I'm kind of repeating myself, but one of the, hopefully the takeaway here isn't necessarily what exactly we did to Kitty, but lessons that may be applicable to other applications as well. So what's so unusual about running a service like this under Kubernetes? Well, it turns out about a few months after starting working on the project, um, I said to a coworker, well, you know, seeing how this environment works, it's a lot like what you'd see on a more traditional system, only compressed down. You know, running for a week in this system is like running a year in your typical storage data center. Um, important takeaways are that the environment is very dynamic. Uh, you have 
nodes coming up and down. The services are expected to move on their own. And uh, there are certain aspects to Kubernetes that you can see harken back to its origin as a system for managing, man, mainly for managing stateless microservices. There's some complexity around how the networking in works and that um, uh, the storage server wants to use what we call host networking, but a lot of the applications are more oriented around the actual native networking inside of the system, and that can add some additional complexity as well. And last, probably the most important, is the user expectation. Users really expect to have um, very automated deployments, whereas in the traditional data center with storage, you know, you would be, you know, talking to your coworker or making a ticket in a ticketing system versus the uh, Kubernetes PV and PVC mechanism where the application developer is actually asking the system for storage itself. People just expect this to work. So early on, uh, because of the simplicity of the service, it was fairly easy to get it running in Kubernetes. Um, it was very easy to convert to a pod. It's a single binary. It has um, um, logging to standard out already. It didn't have any complex demonization. It just forked and ran, um, or the parent forked it and ran it. So it was very easy to get it running as a, you know, a containerized service. One of the nice things about doing that is it gave the system some fairly simple HA properties right off the bat. Um, the database that the Kitty system uses was placed directly on a volume uh, managed by Gluster. And because Gluster is a network file system, the database could move. So if the Hecate pod or the node it was running on went down, the system could simply run on another node. Unfortunately, it's not multi-master because the database format is very simplistic, but it at least uh, has some basic HA capability. Um, and then finally, one of the interesting aspects of the system is that as it manages sys, uh, sorry, cluster pods, or containerized cluster, it uses Kubernetes' own native uh, command execution framework. This is the same thing that you end up using if you run a kubectl uh, exec. Okay, so now, getting more into the meat of it, um, when we kind of started looking at some of the reliability issues on the system, and we started analyzing what, what was there, we quickly realized that what the system was trying to do was use language mechanisms that are there for error handling, but that don't really work outside the scope of a single execution of the process. Um, specifically, um, I'm talking about the defer mechanism in Golang. Uh, so what the system was doing is expecting that, you know, if there was an error handling condition X, that the defer statement would be able to revert that and clean it up. The problem is, in this very dynamic environment, the application could crash, could be evicted, whatever, and so the process was being terminated at points along the execution chain. So it might be creating some uh, LVM LVs or Gluster Bricks. The next thing you know, um, you've been deleted or evicted, and then you come back up, the state of the system is no longer consistent. So one of the things we realized is that we had to stop relying just on the mechanisms that the language provided us and actually work on some of the design such that the system would be able to survive being terminated, come back up, and do sensible things. So this brings us to what we ended up calling the operations layer. You could call it all sorts of different things. Um, I've seen other tools do stiff, similar things. Um, but ultimately, the point is to bake reliability into the design. Um, so what we chose was kind of a record what you do before you do it approach. 
this design was, was uh, created in order to allow us to roll back anything that we had started at any point. So no matter where you crash along the way, or get terminated, along the way, the system will be able to come back up, see what its state was, and then undo that. Um, one of the things we had thought about is that perhaps we could add resumability. Uh, we haven't done that. Some of the operations aren't naturally resumable, but ones that were could have considered doing that. So one of the um, aspects of this system was that we designed it such that the um, the state that was recorded into the database would allow us to analyze the oh, I'm repeating myself, sorry about that. Um, uh, <laughs> Anyway, long story short, uh, the initial version of the system had um, creation and rollback, but what we really wanted was you know, a fully robust approach that would allow us to do anything after crash. Unfortunately, we had a lot of other deliverables at the same time, so what we ended up doing is making sure that the design covered what we wanted to do, but that we would have to come back and implement the cleanup later. In the meantime, as we were working on other features, we had put the operations framework out into the field. We um, had to build some stopgap tools. This ended, actually ended up being a really good experience for us because we were building tools that were very generic, simple to use, um, that over time we were able to you know, share with other teams. And it helped us actually implement the cleanup stuff when we eventually got around to doing it. So we had this framework in place, we had this metadata in our database, and then the tools that were external to the process could help us clean things up in the meantime in a somewhat semi-manual approach. And then we were able to work on the fully automatic cleanup over time. One of the things that kept us from doing everything right away is that the system had a fairly nice test framework, but it was really only testing the happy path. Um, so we had to take a side route and spend a good amount of time developing an error, uh, error testing framework. And this included building error injection into the system itself. So by setting up the configuration in a certain way, we could actually induce errors at any particular step along the uh, chain of actions the system has to perform to set up the storage. And then at that point, we could test the various failure scenarios that the cleanup code was supposed to handle. And then eventually, about, I want to say, six months after we had shipped the first version with operations, uh, we had developed our cleanup code and were able to provide that to our users and our customers. As part of the experience working on these uh, problems, we learned that one of the imp other important aspects to keeping the system reliable was to build uh, good, ro robust diagnostic tools, tools that help the user get to the root of the problem as fast as possible. You know, we wanted to keep the tools simple um, and evolve them as we worked on cases to um, you know, we, want, we were learning along the way and building tools, you know, based on our experiences. Um, so a lot of stuff that did get built into the server is very useful. It's in the field now. Um, but still, some of the tools that we had built externally uh, we're still using fairly frequently. Uh, one of the ones that I like to use, I use it fairly frequently, is a tool that allows me to compare the state of the Hecate database along with the state of the Gluster system and Kubernetes itself. It will show us any discrepancies, and we can use that to either debug or even fix the problem sometime. 
Uh, lastly, I want to mention that we have built in some metrics into the system. This is useful for both admins who are, um, you know, trying to monitor the state of the system, but by building in metrics around the operations themselves, um, you can have an idea of the overall health of the system. If if the operations are failing, or they're not getting automatically cleaned up, that's a time for actually a human to intervene versus, you know, the automatic cleanup will just work in a while. Okay, so now, as I was kind of joking at the bottom, here is my do as I say, not as I do. Um, it turns out that there are many things I would love to do with the system, and that are generally a good idea, but we don't, we're not fully there yet. So I just want to talk about this briefly. Um, one of the issues with what we're doing in the system is that we have duplicate state. We have state both in Gluster and in the Keddy database itself. Ideally, what we'd be doing is minimizing that, taking away as much unique state from a Keddy. Now, that could also lead to some performance problems. So the other aspect is to use the state in the database more as a cache. And we've done that a little bit by adding a device resync command. So Hiketi needs to know about the sizes of the devices and the amount of things being stored on them. Um, to make allocation decisions. However, if something is changed on the system by the admin or if there is a bug or something, we have a tool that allows us to invalidate what's in the DB and replace that with what's live on the system. So we get the benefit of actually having fast local data, but having the ability to you know, reconcile that with what's actually on the system. It would be nice if we were actually able to do that more for some of the other storage objects, something we may or may not be able to do in the short term, but it would be nice. Okay, so here's my summary slide. So story, long story short, um, one of the issues we encountered was that the, the code was written in a way to just try and naturally take care of itself, but that kind of organic growth doesn't really pay off. Um, so nothing beats design for making software reliable. You've got to build it in as early as you can, and, um, and if you have to bolt it on later like we did, um, it takes, it's worthwhile taking some thought into it and making it so that, like we did with our cleanup code, you can implement a lot of it, um, the core data structures and then do the um, other parts later on. Um, it's important to be able to track what you need versus what you don't. Um, and you know, learning from our errors was very important. And that's it for the talk. Um, thank you, everybody, for coming. If you have any questions, um, it's a small crowd, and I know the party's coming up. And I had bike troubles the whole time. So well, uh, we appreciate it if you have any questions. But um, that's it for me. Um, so I was wondering about your operations uh, layer that sounds like a kind of a journaling based solution. Um, did you guys use a replicated state machine for that or do you care about the high availability of that log or worry about that or how do you worry about like yeah what if the log gets corrupted basically is my kind of Yeah, no that actually does happen. Um, so one of the issues is again from the evolution of the system that we have what's um, it's called bolt DB it's a native Golang uh, database. Unfortunately, um, 
it does have some drawbacks, and that's a single file database. If it goes away, you're kind of toast. And that goes back to what I was saying about the cache. Ideally, we'd be able to derive all that information from the system. Unfortunately, there are some unique pieces of data that are only kept in the Hecate DB at this time. Um, We've done a little work in the meantime trying to store more metadata in Gluster itself, but unfortunately Gluster wasn't designed to store arbitrary metadata on all the volumes, so it's a trade-off. Um, one of the things about the framework that we also tried to do that I, I meant to mention that I, must, I think I skipped was that um, we were also trying to retain backwards compatibility with the uh, existing systems out there in the field, um, so we didn't want disrupt our users very much. We're a very small team, so it, it was, uh, you know, we could have gone off for two years and tried to redesign everything to use etcd or whatever. You know, there are times where I wish we had done that, but uh, it paid off for a lot of our users in the short term. Okay, very cool. Also glad to hear about Ball TV. That's cool, Sue. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you.